Good afternoon. Uh, we're in Natick, Massachusetts this afternoon on April 5th, 1999. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. May I ask what your name is, please? My name is uh, William Joris, and I'm probably better known as Vic. Okay, William Joris, call Vic. And what is your address? I'm Framingham, Massachusetts. Are you currently married? Yes. And do, mind, do you mind if I ask you your age? I'll be 73 in May. <clears throat> 73. Okay. Going to be 73. How about children? I have two sons and three grandsons. And where were you born, Vic? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. And uh, how, did, how did you come to be in Natick or Framingham? Oh, after uh, getting out of the service, I met my wife. Uh, very shortly after uh, being released and um, we went together, got married and lived in Boston for a couple of years and then decided to move out into the uh, country or the sticks, so to speak. It was the sticks then, yeah, wasn't so it? So we looked at Natick and we yeah. looked at Framingham and uh, chose Framingham. Can you tell us something about your family background, your parents, or uh, what you were doing in Boston at the, uh, in the beginning? Okay, my uh, parents both uh, immigrated from uh, Russia in the uh, oh, very early 1900s, maybe 19, around 1910. My father was a musician all his life. He, uh, played with a lot of the big bands of the time, uh, Ruby Newman and uh, well, I guess I've forgotten some of them. It's too many years. Uh, he used to play in New York and he used to play in Boston, sometimes around Worcester, New Hampshire. And he played for uh, a lot of private affairs as well as, uh, yeah. oh, he played at Norbega Park. And uh, what did he play? He played the trumpet. Um, I learned to, well, I took piano lessons as a child. I took uh, about five years of concert music. And uh, before going into the service, occasionally I would fill in as pianist for uh, his orchestra if the piano player was going to be late. And that's. Pretty much it. That's marvelous to have uh, someone has come over here and uh, that was a very famous orchestra. I knew I've I, I think I've heard them play. Yeah, they played for the New England Council meetings uh, when they used to have their annual meetings <coughs> all over New England. That's wonderful. Now you were in Boston uh, at the, about the time the First World War came, Second World War came along. Oh sure. Is that where you enlisted? Yes, I enlisted in uh, Commonwealth Avenue at the... Uh, at the armory there? Uh, it wasn't really an armory. Uh, not, it, it had become a, um, a depot of some sort, but not the armory per se. The armory was a little further down. Mm -hmm. But that's where I enlisted after unsuccessfully trying to enlist in the Navy and then the Marines. Uh, I was 17. At at the time, then finally I said, "Well, I gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do." I was, uh, not to be corny, fiercely jingoistic. I, you know, I just had a had to be part of what was going on and uh, do what I could to support this country. Can you tell us about enlisting? Uh, did you go to this to this uh, a recruitment place on center, essentially, or a recruitment center first? Can you tell us about uh, your choice of the Army? Well, uh, I tried to, as I said, I tried to enlist in the Navy first. Went through the complete physical, passed the whole thing, uh, except when it came to my eyes. So they rejected me because my eyes weren't sufficient for what their requirements were. Uh, a couple months later, I decided, well, now I'm going to try the Marines, and went through the beginning of the physical and this recruiting uh, yeoman or whatever he was, he worked for the Navy and the Marines, he said, that name is familiar, you must have been around here before. 
I said, uh, yeah. He said, if you didn't get in the Navy, how are you going to get in the Marines? I said, didn't know. So another couple of months went by, and I went up to the recruiting building, or whatever it was, and uh, said, I want to enlist in the Army. And they said, uh, you couldn't, not without your parents' signature, because you're 17. So I said, okay, give me the, give me the paperwork. Well, I went back, and my parents absolutely refused. They weren't going to let their baby, I wasn't the baby, but the middle one, but I was still a baby to them, uh, go in the service. And so uh, after arguing with them for a day or so, I took the paper and asked my father to sign it. And he refused. He said, I'm not going to do it. So I beat my head against the wall. I said, I'm going to beat my head against the wall until you sign the paper. And I kept beating my head against the wall, and, and I broke the wall. You mean quite literally? Literally, oh yeah. I, I just was obsessed uh, ever since uh, Pearl Harbor. I had to get in the service. You know, everyone was praying the war would end, and I was praying that the war wouldn't end until I could get in and help to end it, I guess. Yeah, Vic, can you tell us something about your father's feelings? Came to this country in 1910. This is 33 years later, and his son wants to get into the Army. Uh, what, were, what were his feelings well, about this? Well, he understood. This? He really understood. So he signed the papers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my mother started to cry, and I suppose my father was close to the same, but... Uh, yeah. They signed the papers, and you were next, in. pardon? And then you were in. Well, next morning I went down to take the physical. Now, yeah. would I pass the Army physical? I didn't know. So I went through the whole thing and uh, stood there and watched while some doctor went accepted. And I was, you know, complete elation. I was in the Army because uh, within hours they swore me in in the reserves, because I was still 17. And uh, June 6th occurred. I enlisted May 8th, 1944. June 6th, uh, when the uh, Allies invaded France occurred, I um, couldn't understand why I hadn't been called up yet. So I called up this recruiting sergeant three or four days later, and I said, uh, you know, what's the story? He says, you can't go until you're 18. He says, and there's no sense calling here. So I waited and waited, and a couple more weeks passed, and I turned 18, called him up again. He said, very soon. Yeah, I, I just had no patience with this whole thing. And oh, a week or two later, I had my orders. My father took me to the train station in, uh, in Boston, and the orders directed me to... Um, uh, present myself at Fort Devens. And he took me to the train. Before he put me on the train, he went into a bar himself, because I never had any whiskey. And uh, he said, wait a minute, I'll be right out. And he went in. He wasn't gone two minutes. And he came back out again. I said, what'd you do there? Because he, did, he didn't drink. I didn't even ever see him drink wine. And he said, uh, I had a Boilermaker. I said, what the heck is a Boilermaker? Boiler he said, whiskey and beer. He said, now I can say goodbye to you. Really? And it was hard, hard for me, hard for him. I can understand that. At the time you joined, uh, did any of your friends join with you, or no. were you strictly on your I own? I was on my own, yeah. So that when you get on that train to Fort Devens, you were strictly not yeah. alone, but you didn't know any other. I knew of the no people. one else. No, that's correct. Um, where did you go, Fort Devens first? Fort Devens first. That was a uh, um, uh, a placement center. Yeah. And uh, I was there maybe two weeks, three weeks, and then uh, I received orders to proceed to a only to a train station. I never knew where we were going. And uh, so I went onto a, onto a train with hundreds of other brand new GIs. And uh, we started to travel 
and uh, oh, one or two days out of air of Massachusetts, Fort Devens. Is that where you got on the train? Right. Yeah. I think it was. I, it's, it's now so long ago, I'm not absolutely certain. We may have gone by truck. Uh, because I was in the Army so many years and so many different camps, sometimes some of these things get a little confused in my mind. But uh, I'm pretty certain we, prob we got on at Fort Devens. Uh, two days later, an enormous train was attached to us maybe eight or ten other um, cars, all filled with sailors to be. Which they were way sailors. Were you, sailors. Which way were you headed? West. Just west. That's you, all that's, I know. You didn't know any else? I had no idea where we were going. Yeah. Uh, a couple of days later, the, the Navy men and the train that they were on all disappeared, and we were left alone, and then we started to head south. And most of us thought we were going to Fort First, they thought we were going to Fort Benning, Georgia. Then others thought we were going to, um, oh, there's an infantry camp in, in Texas, and I've forgotten it now. But we ended up at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That's the artillery center. And uh, I began basic training uh, a couple, three days later. Where did you first know where you were and what you were supposed to do? Well, we got to Fort Sill. When you got off the train, somebody said, welcome to Oklahoma. Welcome to uh, the Artillery Center in Fort Sill, yeah. Everything was, was kept as secret as possible. Uh, at that time, I, I guess the government felt that any, any kind of information that could be given to the Germans or the Japanese would, could possibly uh, have some detriment, detrimental effect on us. So we oh. never knew where we were going. What was, uh, were you then in an artillery unit? No, it was an artillery training center. Okay. Uh, it was called artillery something, 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 but it wasn't really an artillery unit. It was a, uh, a unit used strictly for training. That, that unit would never go anywhere. Most of the uh, so officers and uh, um, sergeants and the like would, would remain there. And every 16 weeks, a group of young recruits would come in and they'd train us and go on to the next uh, group. What specifically did you learn? Communications. There? So you were in a communications organization within an artillery uh, f right. organization. That's correct. Okay. And what, what were you, a lineman or, or what form of communications? Well, radio. radio communications. Radio, radio communications. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of the training you had? Uh, for the first six weeks, it was the same as uh, every soldier in the Army at the time was, was experiencing uh, how to be an infantryman, essentially. Uh, the only thing they added was a little bit of uh, indoctrination in what an artillery piece was like, and that was the 105 howitzer. Then there were several weeks of intensive artillery training where they taught you how the artillery piece worked and how to fire it and what to do. And then each one of us was put into, we were put into different groups and I was put into communications and I was taught, uh, even though I knew some of the rudiments of, of electronics, I uh, learned Morse code and all kinds of communications. Whatever radios we had, I learned how they worked and how to uh, set up antennas and uh, the like. What did you like or dislike the most about your basic training? I was so enthused about everything that uh, I suppose what what most GIs dislike KP and uh, and guard duty. Uh, it was it was part of the learning game, but uh, we were learning so much, and it wasn't uh, anything that that even resembled uh, nine to five. We'd be up at four thirty five o'clock in the morning, and most days we wouldn't finish until eight nine ten at night and just collapse in, take a shower, collapse into bed, and off again. Or take a shower in the morning, whatever. 
How long what did that go doing. on? Did, is, did you the say whole thing weeks? was 16 weeks. Okay, where, about what date was that in 44 when uh, your training ended? My training ended around September or October of 44. Late September or early October. Okay, that's about three months after D-Day. Yeah. Uh, did, you, did you have any idea where you would be sent from Oklahoma? No, absolutely no idea. And how did you get your orders then? I received orders to um, proceed on a certain, in fact, most everyone in this particular training unit had already received orders, except I and my closest friend, and I've kept in touch with him, uh, Ronald Horton, uh, for, for the entire length of time. Um, he and I received the same orders report to the 942nd Field Artillery Battalion with a delay en route Boston for the equivalent of a furlough. So you got a furlough? After well, yeah, it wasn't weeks. really a furlough. They called it a delay en route. Yeah. So yeah. we were sent home for a few days. Things were getting pretty nasty in a way in Europe. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge hadn't occurred yet. Uh, only the generals thought that, that the Germans were on the, on the run but not the people who were fighting. And uh, so we had a short delay en route. I reported to the 942nd Field Artillery Battalion at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I came in maybe oh, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night by train and reported to the orderly room, which is the normal routine. And the uh, guy, the uh, corporal there, or whatever he was, uh, took took down my name and took my papers, and he said, uh, "Print out your name, so we can make a stencil." I said, "What's a stencil for?" He says, "For a duffel bag." I said, "What's a duffel bag for?" He says, "We're already set for overseas," so it was you know, boom, 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 boom. This uh, Ronald Horton was he from Boston? No, he was from Hubbardsville, New York. So he left you at. at Oklahoma, or you left him at Oklahoma? No, both of us received the same orders. And, you, and he we came both, east with you? Yes. Yeah. And well, he went to New York on a delay en route, yeah. and I went to Boston. But he wound up at Fort Bragg with you. And both of us in, were directed to go to Fort Bragg, that's correct. Anybody else in your outfit from Oklahoma that uh, you saw after that? Uh, no. What happened at Fort Bragg then? You, you got a duffel bag and did you get any additional training? Oh yeah, but it was fast and furious. It was a matter of a couple, three weeks. Uh, everything was moving so fast. Uh, we were ordered to uh, Fort Dix or Camp Kilmer, and I can't remember. I believe it was Camp Kilmer. And since this is an artillery unit, not an infantry unit, you need enormous amounts of equipment compared to infantry. So it would take a while for all our equipment to come with us. You take everything with you. And uh, then we received more training. Now we're in the dead of winter. This was December. They trained us how to uh, climb uh, down these rope ladders from ships. Uh, so again, we had no idea where we were going. How were, you, were you still in, in communications? Oh, yeah. And you're, you're mixing that up with infantry training then? Yeah, well, the, art, the artillery is only one step above infantry. Yeah. Uh, the inf infantry will move up, and the artillery is always directly behind them. And the smaller the size of the gun, the closer uh, they work with the infantry. Were you still with the howitzers? Yeah, one of the 155 howitzers. Yeah. See, so the 105 howitzer might be with the artillery. Infantry. Uh, I don't recall that there were uh, 105 howitzer artillery units. I think the uh, generally the biggest, uh, the smallest units were 155. What happened then? You were up in New Jersey? Uh, in Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and yeah. then we, uh, we were given, occasionally we were given a pass to go to uh, wherever. But they were very short because they didn't know when they were orders were going to be received to, to uh, embark. Mm -hmm. And uh, I 
went home for a few hours, so three or four hours, back to Boston, took the train back to camp. Uh, a couple days later, we received orders to proceed to a, an embarkation point. Mm -hmm. And that was around the, uh, the Navy docks at uh, New York or New Jersey. They own maybe? I don't know. I can't remember. Had this, had at this time, the Battle of the Bulge begun, right? And you guys heard about when, it when when the Battle of the Bulge broke out. Uh, all the orders were canceled, so this was uh, December, and no longer were we going on these twelve-hour passes. We stayed there until they could get us on a ship. Okay, and you sailed out of New York Harbor then. Some, well, yeah. maybe New Jersey, maybe New York. I don't yeah. really recall. Can you tell us about that getting on the ship? Uh, the band was playing, the Star Spangled Band, and the hair on my head stood up straight. I had a lot of hair then. But it was, it was just raw excitement. And it never ceased. That, that kind of, it just built up to, a, to a, so much tension. And uh, we boarded the ship, and uh, then we headed north. The, the weather got absolutely abominable. And uh, the first day out to sea, we had a blanket of aircraft over us, and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of ships. I, I never in my life could envision any, any convoy having this many ships. Were you headed for Halifax? We went up near Halifax and then started to head east. Mm -hmm. Tell us the, about going overseas in wartime on a board. A well, ship it was like that. it was as mu much excitement as I guess you can imagine. We were uh, out to sea for about two or three days, and uh, somebody came down from up deck because the weather was it was just horrible. Uh, one of the guys on uh, in my communications outfit was thrown against the the side of the ship and broke his leg, and we didn't see him for months when we landed. But uh, the weather was just horrible. And then somebody came down and said, uh, we've, our air cover is gone. So apparently we were now far enough out to sea that the aircraft couldn't just hang around us. Mm -hmm. And we started to head east. The next morning, uh, I went up on deck. And, and all the storm and the cold and everything had disappeared. We couldn't understand what was going on. And uh, I said to a Navy guy, we had a bunch of Navy gunners on the ship. I said, I looked up at the sky, I said, what's, what's going on? He says, didn't you hear all the noise last night? I said, well, I heard noise. I thought it was waves smashing against the uh, side of the ship. And he said, no, we were throwing ash cans over. He said, there are, there's a submarine pack chasing us. And uh, he said, we have no air cover. He said, and just about that time, destroyers would go racing by, uh, destroyer escorts, smaller ships, in, in an effort to try and find where these submarines were. The next day, it was totally balmy weather. And we were in the Caribbean. So apparently, the, they decided to break up this convoy. And uh, the submarines had continue to chase us and whatever ships were with our segment down toward the Caribbean. And uh, every night, not in the daytime, but every night they'd throw ash cans over because the submarines would come in close. They didn't want to come near us in the daytime. These ash cans are, are depth charges. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, if I can get this clear in my mind, the convoy broke up, some continued east. But your section of it went down into... To the best of my knowledge, yeah. some continued east, and, and uh, the, our segment, how many ships were in it, I have no idea. How did you get news on board ship as to what was happening to you? Mm, we didn't. You just asked the sailors the, or the, the Navy? The sailors tend to, yeah. would tend to know more. Uh, the merchant marines that were uh, running the ship uh, knew little about what was going on. Uh, what was going on in, as far as the Battle of the Bulge, nobody knew. Nobody knew what was happening in, in Japan. You just, you just go. Where did you finally land? We landed, uh, our ship landed, uh, we were supposed to go to, to England. 
when we, we landed in La Havre, France, and uh, we found out that the, uh, the reason that we were diver diverted is because the ship that carried our guns was sunk in the harbor between France and England, somewhere in the channel. So all our guns were lost, and they decided to divert us again. Rather than go to England, we were sent immediately to France. Uh, when we landed in France, uh, if there's a worst experience, I guess that was a, the worst. We got off the ship at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. We were loaded onto enormous uh, personnel carriers, these enormous trucks. And uh, there was somewhere between 1 and 2 feet of snow on the trucks. None of us knew where we were going. Nobody told us to clean the snow off. They just said, we're going. A few of us, there was a long wooden bench, and maybe eight or ten of us sat on the bench. A lot, a lot of guys just stood. And we got colder and colder and colder. Uh, one of the guys driving the truck said that the temperature was at least five below zero. And it uh, turned out we stayed on these trucks for ten hours. When I got on, when we got to our location, this was uh, a camp called Camp Lucky Strike. There were several cigarette camps, Lucky Strike, Camel, Chesterfields. And to this day, I've never been able to find out. I've written to the Globe. I've written to the government. No one seems to know where these camps were. They were in France, but I don't know where they were. Vic, you were on a ship that sailed through the Caribbean, then turned over to the coast of France, which had obviously just been liberated so you could land there. Yeah. How were you dressed in the, in the winter? Uh, we had um, just typical uh, ODs, all of drab uh, woolen clothes. We had a jacket, uh, an overcoat, but uh, the boots were you know, mezzo mezzo, they were all right. Uh, no gloves, no scarves, and uh, we were not f as fully equipped as you might have thought mm -hmm. that the Army might have been equipped. Uh, and we found out that a lot of it was going to the infantry because certainly they needed it more than we did. Because no matter what we experienced, it was nothing compared to what they were experiencing. So this is roughly the beginning of 1945, January That's correct. 1st. That's correct. And you were at a place called Camp Lucky Strike. That's right. Which I hope sometime we can find out where it was. Yeah. Um, what did you do there? At Lucky Strike, we just uh, basically tried to keep warm. Uh, we broke up German revetments that had been built by the Germans and used it to keep warm, and we waited for our guns. He uh, said to be replacement guns. Then. Right, yeah. and they were gonna come from England. And uh, it took about a month Finally, now, the, the Battle of the Bulge had, had broken. But the fighting was still continuing and, um, in the Ardennes. Uh, our guns came in, oh, maybe in February, and we proceeded to a town called Monneville. Some of us and others were in a town called Fulto in France. And we went through some quick training, uh, waited for more equipment. I don't know that, I think we got our guns, but we never got ammunition. I don't remember uh, receiving uh, ammunition until uh, we were getting ready to leave these two French cities. Um, by this time now, all the, the uh, oh, while we were in Lucky Strike, all the vehicles that we had were equipped with wire cutting bars. The Germans had been stringing steel wires across all the roads. Incidentally, coming into a Camp Lucky Strike, everything was mined. Uh, okay, you asked what did I do at Camp Lucky Strike. I did mine sweeping on the Cherbourg Peninsula. The Germans had left thousands, tens of thousands of mines. Had you been trained to do that? Mine sweeping? No. Yeah. We, we, we got instant training in the in a couple of hours by some ordnance guys that, that they would send over. 
Can you tell us about looking for mines in a, in a heavily mined area, <laughs> what it was like? Just, just, you just do it. It wasn't anything that you, to get scared about. You just did, did it. I don't know. Uh, somebody said, here's a mine detector. Go look for mines. And every so often you hear this big explosion. Somebody, somebody. had found a mine and, and they got the, uh, the team in and they would detonate it and throw it over. Um, some of these things are, are pretty vague. The, the weather was so abominable, so cold, uh, I froze my feet there. I mean, I froze them. And there was some talk as to whether I would lose my feet. And uh, a medic... Of, this is because of the boots you had been given? Well, combination boots, snow, ice, rain, mud, mm -hmm. more snow. Uh, if you read any of the historical... Uh, weather information about what the... That was a bad year. It was, it was just yeah. horrible. Europe was horrible. How, how the Germans, how the Americans managed to fight a battle in the bulge, how Patton brought his troops up, it's just, it's just inconceivable. At this point, uh, about February of 45, had you used any of the uh, training that you got as a radio operator? None, not yet. So you were now waiting for ammunition, and um, were you in any relative distance to combat? Were you no. aware of nearby? There were several. So the only thing we heard is V-2 rockets going overhead yeah. constantly. Uh, we were apparently near a uh, near being within 500 miles of some German base where they were launching V-2 rockets into uh, into London and England in general. But no, we weren't, weren't anywhere near that. All right, can you tell us what happened to you then? Uh, we received apparently all of our equipment, all our ammunition, guns, everything. And uh, we were then to proceed. We joined up with a tank column, uh, two, tank, two tank battalions. So we had an artillery battalion and two tank battalions. And we headed up into uh, uh, northern France and then into Belgium and Holland and uh, entered Germany oh, sometime in March, I guess it was. You, co you covered quite a distance in one month then. Uh, it wasn't one month. It, it sounds like because there were things that happen in between that that's just too difficult to, to remember. We would bivouac sometimes with uh, 50,000 infantrymen in some town, and then you'd hold up for a while while equipment went out or, or troops, some troops went out. Maybe we'd move, maybe we wouldn't move. So we actually only probably traveled 350 to 400 miles. Mm -hmm. But uh, we moved very, very, very slowly. But you were moving now as a, a fully equipped artillery oh, yeah. organization. Yeah. Yeah. And not, what happened now? Uh, we were attached to the 15th Army. The 15th Army was a paper army. And uh, under this Lieutenant General Giraud, uh, he was... I guess a, a um, logistician. He had, I would guess, under him maybe uh, 500,000 to 100 to a million men, and they would be directed in different areas. We always stayed under the 15th Army. That was our aegis. But uh, initially, we were sent to the to uh, give artillery support to the 7th Army. And then we were shifted to the, uh, I think Patton's was the third army. Then we were sent to give artillery support to Patton's third army. What is the definition of a paper army then? It, it itsel itself, it doesn't go anywhere. He was, uh, Giraud was somewhere in France at his headquarters. And uh, he would just send 10,000 troops uh, let's say we uh, we had suffered five or ten thousand casualties in one area. He'd bring up an infantry division and and uh, maybe an artillery brigade. 
and put him into that position. He would assign them to the Seventh Army. Okay. Right. Uh, when the Seventh Army had finished their mission and had maybe brought in their own replacements, we would be sitting in limbo. Fifteenth Army would direct us to another army. When you went to any of these other armies, your organization, were you then in combat? Yeah. Can you tell us about what happened to you there? Um, when I arrived, I, I was uh, uh, used, about a hundred of us were used as road markers. They would drop us off at certain points. And then as this column, artillery column, uh, moved into uh, whatever direction we were supposed to go, uh, we would direct them where, where they should go. We were given instructions pointing them in the right direction. We were road markers. And then we were picked up and brought back to camp. When I was brought back to, uh, to the first point where we were in contact with the Germans, uh, they had been firing, our artillery units had been firing all day long. I was in the headquarters battery, and uh, the artillery batteries were A, B, C, and D, each one consisting of four artillery guns, and they had been firing all day. So I joined them, and then uh, I was, whether it was that minute, within hours, uh, a communication truck was set up, and uh, so I was part of that. And there was another communication truck set out in the woods. And it um, turned out that our mission was to eliminate a, uh, an enormous railroad gun that had been uh, keeping everyone from crossing the Rhine at that point. And uh, we fired and fired and fired and fired and to no avail. Behind us were 240 millimeter guns those were half again as large as ours. And they couldn't get this railroad gun. It would come out and we would never spot it. Now we had spotter pilots flying around, two L5s. And um, this is a light observation. Right. Yeah. And uh, they never could, never could catch that, uh, that gun. I was in one of the radio trucks out in the woods trying to get some weather information that maybe something was wrong with with uh, the direction that we were firing, or maybe maybe the wind was affecting our shells because nobody could hit this. And uh, we, we were there for a while. I tried to get information, and then I was ordered to move the truck out of there. At that time, apparently the Germans must have located us, and they started to fire on the 240s because that was as close as they could triangulate. And um, the next day, two days later, three days, I don't know, uh, I was on the radio and the, the, one of the pilots was flying around and he started screaming in my ear, I've got him, I've got him, I've got him. And he, he was the, just coming out. Found the big gun? Yeah, he found that big gun. He was just coming out and all he did was, was uh, give, everyone knew the coordinates. The artillery, uh, the battery commander of probably, I don't know, was, I think it was C Battery that was closest to us, knew the coordinates. And he just told them to open fire and just, just lay down a barrage. And they finally blew the gun up. The next day, he, uh, he asked me if I wanted to take a ride and see what was going on up there. So uh, I had never been in a plane before. And, uh, you know, just some more excitement. And I went running pell-mell to this little landing field and uh, got in the plane. And he flew us, flew me over the, uh, the front lines. And he said, do you see them there? I said, no. What do I, see what? He says, German troops. He says, there are thousands down there. I couldn't see them. I think I was just so excited, I'm not sure what I could see. Did you see the gun? No, no. That, whatever the, was there at the gun, there couldn't have been anything left. Because eventually, our battalion, and as well as the 240 behind us, opened up on that gun. Once it was out and hit, that was it. It was dead. But I never saw the gun. You're a long way from Boston now, and you're uh, in, in combat. Um, do you feel you were well prepared for what, where you were? Oh, yeah. Did the Army uh, 
make an effort to talk to you about cultural differences you might run into when you got over there? No. In fact, I got a kick out of the question. Uh, None of that. You know what the cultural difference is? You kill them before they kill you. There, there was, you, you could care less. Uh, that phrase may have been all right when uh, we were in Vietnam uh, or even during the Korean War. But not in Central Europe? No. no. Uh, were, for example, was Ron Horton or anybody else you knew with you at this time? Oh, yeah. He was, a, he he was, was the same radio man as I was. We, we were the gold dust twins. Wherever one went, the other one went. How did you hear about what was going on around you at this Never time? Never did. Everything was moving to the uh, east. That's correct. And you were following along with them yeah. and in combat. Uh, nobody, you couldn't get any information as to the larger picture that you were in? Oh, maybe, maybe somebody, I, it, you're too busy. You know, it, it's not as if you have a, an orientation uh, the way we did during basic training. E every day at noontime, they would tell us about uh, where the front was, what was going on in Japan, what was going on mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, but uh, during combat, no. Okay. Um, we're getting close to the end of the war, a couple of months away. What were you doing now and where were you headed? Uh, we moved closer to the Rhine and now we were assigned to the 101st Airborne. And we continued to fire, this time on Dusseldorf and around Cologne. And uh, what we had, we and about a million Americans, we had 500,000 Germans. And this was uh, uh, Group B, so-called Group B, the German army. Uh, I knew his name, but I'd forgotten his name. And they were trapped. Eventually, they capitulated, they surrendered. And sometime later, uh, we were pulled off the front line because only certain elements were going to go forward to meet the Russians at the Elbe. <coughs> and uh, we were again reassigned to the 15th Army. <coughs> Excuse me. and pulled back and became um, MGPs, Military Government Police. And uh, we were given, oh, five or 10,000 captured German prisoners of war in one compound. Our battalion, as well as uh, one other battalion, took care of them, tried to feed them, fed them one can of sea rations a day. And um, we moved from there to another location, and this had been a sanitarium, a tuberculosis sanitarium. I don't remember what we were doing there, but early in the morning there was this unbelievable drone. It was a bright, bright day, and uh, I don't know where the United States got this many planes, but the sky was completely covered with planes. The sun, it was like a, like a, uh, a, um, um, an eclipse of the sun. It was, it was just absolutely unbelievable, mind-boggling. And I have no idea where they were going. We, we didn't even hear the explosions. I assume they were going to Berlin. This is about the time they, they were running thousand plane raids. Yeah, um, if they were a thousand, must this been, must have been two and three thousand or that more. That must have been a spectacular it, sight. It, it, it's something I just don't think I would ever forget. It just. Hmm. What happened then? Um, we were always moving around, uh, trying to remember why or what purpose, I don't know. We finally moved into a, a small town and... Um, this is in Germany? Oh, from the, yeah, from now on I Germany. stayed always in Germany. Yeah. And uh, we became part of a, a, an enormous occupation army. 
And uh, several months later, oh, May 8th occurred. So the war is over. May 8th occurred. Europe. The war is over in Europe. Uh, we then went immediately into training for an amphibious invasion of Japan. We were going to be the first artillery units to land using, um, only because it was 1945, they were going to use enormous rafts to put our guns on and float us in so that they could start using them on the rafts. It was, it was like a mad madness, but that's what, what the only information we got as to what we were doing. Where was this training taking place? Oh, in various places in, uh, in Germany along the Rhine. Um, Can you tell us what it was like when you realized the war in Europe was over and that you weren't going home, that you were training to go we, to, to nothing, another war? Nothing changed. We knew that once the war in Germany was over, uh, I think all of us felt it was inevitable that we would be sent to the Pacific. Had you enlisted for the duration or a specific number of years? Everyone who enlisted enlisted for the duration. So the duration meant you had to go on to another war. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. because many of the uh, uh, non-commissioned officers in my outfit had come from the Pacific, had come from North Africa. And uh, what they want, and if you read any of the history of, of certain divisions, they will use that division over and over and over again. Even though 50, 75 percent of them are killed, the experience that, that the cadre, that the uh, officers and non-commissioned officers have, you, you just can't replace it. You can't say, okay, we'll put a brand new fresh division in and, uh, you know, they went to school, they know the answers, and they don't know the answers. So they use, once, once you have experience in the military, you use the same outfits over and over and over again. People complain, but that's, that's a fact of life. Did you leave Europe at that point, or what happened to oh, you? Oh, no, then? no, no. I was, uh, um, I remained in Europe at least another year after the war ended as part of the occupation army. The, there was a point system. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you describe that for so many months for points for months and yeah, I don't and I don't recall precisely. It depended on how many battles and battle stars you had, how long you had been in, if you had been in another theater of operation mm -hmm. such as the Pacific or China, Burma, India, or whatever. And uh, when the war ended, I I don't know what I had, forty five points or something like that, and you needed seventy five or eighty or ninety points to go home. So I knew I wasn't going home, but I would be part of the occupation of Germany once, once Japan surrendered. And uh, it wasn't, wasn't the same excitement, it wasn't, you, you knew a little bit more about what might happen tomorrow. Didn't know whether, you, previously you didn't know whether you'd be alive or dead or whatever. Although I don't think any of us gave it much thought. We were too young, too invincible, mm -hmm. because the war ended and I was still 18 years old. I still hadn't turned, ni <coughs> turned 19. Uh, so many of the officers and non-commissioned officers were being sent home that um, I was appointed to OCS in the summer of 40, 46, Office, 45, officers 46, officers, yeah, yeah, in uh, Biarritz in France. And uh, <laughs> I came down with the flu. Not the American flu, but the good old European flu. I was sick as a dog. And so I got over it in a week or so, and then I went to my uh, battery commander and I said, uh, what about OCS? He said, it's a one-shot one deal. We needed uh, thousands of new officers, and it's, it's, it's 90 days that are going to be run just once. And he said, sorry, you know, you missed out on that. I said, all right, well, that's the way it goes. Because I would have had to have re-enlisted again for two or three years. And I would have done it, but it was, it was done. 
And uh, so I spent eight or nine months all, all over Europe. I went to Switzerland, went back to Luxembourg. Uh, almost got killed coming back from Luxembourg, but that gets into lots of crazy stories. Can you tell us one? Uh, well, I suppose the, the, uh, I was setting up some kind of communications in Esch, Luxembourg, and I finished early. I was supposed to be picked up around midnight. <coughs> and um, there was a truck going by, and the guy beat the horn. And I recognized some of the guys from my outfit. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm all set. I'm ready to go back. I got to wait till I get picked up. He said, well, we're going back because we're AWOL, absent without leave. And we have to get back anyway. So I said, oh, great. Two guys. I said, I'll go with you. So we left Luxembourg, and uh, it started to rain, and it started to pour. And uh, we were barreling along the road. I don't know how fast we were going, maybe 50, 60 miles an hour. We hit a huge patch of cow dung. Now, rain, torrential rain, and fresh manure is the same as hitting glare ice. That truck spun completely out of control. The Moselle River was on the right, and, and a, an enormous plowed up field was on the left. Uh, the truck went out of control. I was catapulted over the top of the truck, did a somersault, landed on my back maybe 50 yards or more away from where I was catapulted, tore my face open, my chin, my neck, where I went across the top. There's a, uh, there's a canvas cover on the top of this truck, which was not being used, and there are all these buttons where you attach the canvas. And apparently, my, my chin and my neck caught one of these buttons as I was catapulted. And uh, I landed on my back, as I said, and uh, the uh, GI to my right went flying through the air, did a somersault, and landed on my nose with his head. The driver stayed with the truck, and he landed right beside me with the truck. We uh, tried to climb into the truck and back up, and we hit a, uh, a mud wall, a stone wall, because it was uh, a depressed area where, I, where we had landed. So we climbed up on the road, and we started to walk, and there was a little uh, railroad station. Um, person who takes care of the tracks, and his duty was to clean the tracks or whatever. And I walked in there and asked him if he had some water. I don't know, I was so thirsty, I had no idea why I was so thirsty. And he started talking to me in Flemish, I guess, whatever, Luxembourg, I forget the language. And I had no idea, I turned, you know, talk slowly. I can speak French, some French. But uh, I said, what are you talking about? And he, then he pointed to my face and he took me into the little uh, latrine that he had, and there was a mirror there. And I was just covered with blood, and I was so thirsty because I'd been bleeding. So he gave me some water, and we started to walk, and the uh, jeep came along and uh, took one look at us and uh, he said, what happened? It was a lieutenant and his driver. And uh, somebody, whether I did or one of the guys, told him what happened. And he said, I better get you guys to the hospital. He took me to the hospital. My nose was broken in, I don't know, three or four places. I found out years later that I have a scar on my kidney about the size of a silver dollar, probably where I hit a rock when I landed. And um, the other guys uh, weren't nearly as bruised up as I was, so they went back to, their, uh, to our outfit and uh, I stayed in the hospital two, three more days, and then somebody came and picked me up. The other two were, <clears throat> they weren't court-martialed, but they were demoted to private. One, had been a, one was a sergeant, the other, the other a corporal. And uh, my captain called me in. He said, did you, uh, were you there on, on orders? I said, yeah. I said, you know, talk to my sergeant. He says, yeah. He says, I did. I'm just verifying it. And so. Uh, that's one of the stories. Well, just kind of a lot of crazy things that would happen. 
Uh, I was uh, sergeant of the guard one night, and uh, one of the guys came in to turn, and we were in Ludwigsburg, Germany, as part of uh, the Occupation Army Military Police. And uh, one of the guys came in to turn in his, his weapon, because he was coming off duty. And I said, give it to the, uh, uh, oh, sergeant that took care of all the arms. So he said, okay, and I'm sitting there doing whatever paperwork, and all of a sudden I hear, bam! I jumped up and ran in, and uh, the sergeant did as he always had done whenever somebody came in with a weapon. Is it, is it loaded? No. Discharge it. Well, you're supposed to pull the trigger with the gun facing up. And he said, I'm telling you, there's nothing in it. He said, I'll put my finger across it and pull the trigger. And he put his finger across the muzzle and pulled the trigger, he told me this afterwards, and pulled the trigger. The bullet went through his finger and went through the sergeant's neck and came out through his head. Uh, just the reverse of Kennedy when he was shot, because this was from a different angle. And uh, I grabbed a blanket and wrapped around the sergeant's head. The sergeant was, he was a master sergeant, and he was only a year older than I was, and I was only, uh, you know, I had no rank compared to him. He was a young, young, young kid. And uh, somebody else came running in when they heard the shot and called an ambulance, and uh, an ambulance we had our own. We loaded him into the ambulance, but the room, this orderly room that I was in, that he was in, about this size, there was just blood everywhere, everywhere. We only had one or two casualties during, during the war, but we had lots and lots of casualties after the war. Another guy was opening up a banana oil can, should have known better, somebody should have known better. He put an acetylene torch to it and blew his head off. Uh, another night, uh, somebody was driving and uh, lost control of his vehicle and hit a tree, was catapulted and hit a tree head on and split his head open. Uh, my, one of my grandsons wants to go in the Army and I, I don't want to deter him, but I want him to understand that it's, the military is an extremely dangerous occupation. It's not just a war where, where people get killed, it's just an extremely dangerous... Then look at General Patton. What happened to you then in your military career? Uh, we, I spent about five or six months in Ludwigsburg, Germany, just outside of Stuttgart, and uh, I finally received orders to, I had enough points to start heading home. and. Uh, I was by myself now. Horton, this buddy of mine, mm -hmm. he had been uh, sent home on some kind of leave that he, to this day, doesn't understand why, and then was supposed to come back and join us, and they said, well, he's going to be out in a few months, so they, he stayed home. So I was directed to go back to Lucky Strike, and they gave me a, a, a route in which to get there. And. Um, I first went to, uh, to Mulhaus in France on the same boxcars that were used during the Holocaust. None of us knew what, what these boxcars were until afterwards, until I realized what, what I was on. Uh, from Mulhaus, I was sent to uh, Munich. From Munich, I was supposed to proceed to Le Havre for a lucky strike again. But uh, there was a uh, strike, dock strike, going on in the United States. This was a year after the war. So we couldn't, there was no sense filling up uh, La Havre and, and all these camps with GIs going home since there were no ships to go home. So I stayed in Munich for, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, a month or so. Then I received orders to continue. I went to uh, Lucky Strike again. And this is the first time I had uh, witten seen a, a uh, an integrated army. 
This is the first time blacks and whites were, were put in, in the same uh, units. And then I uh, returned on, the, uh, on a ship called the George Washington. <laughs> we were halfway home and uh, somebody came running down from the deck and said, uh, we're going back. War's been broke, war broke out again. I said, what? And everyone, you know, now we're, everyone's just a little bit uh, disturbed, to say the least. Well, it turned out there was, a, there was a ship heading toward Germany or France or whatever with replacements for guys like me who were going home. And there was a guy on that ship, a soldier on the ship, who said that uh, he had appendicitis. He had terrible pains. They didn't have a doctor. We were an enormous transporting ship, and we had a doctor. So we stopped in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, they transferred him from that ship to ours, and he was faking it. And a bunch of Navy guys risked their lives to get him, because the sea wasn't that calm even then. This was in May or June. I came back to the States. I was... Uh, Excuse sent, me, Vic, but do you remember the ship you came home on? George Washington. The that, USS that, George Washington. That was a big one. Yeah, very big. And where did you land in the States? I landed in, uh, I think, New York Harbor, someplace mm -hmm. there. And there was a, an enormous celebration every time ships came in. There were, uh, Bands and oh, people singing, and you know they bring in the, uh, these groups to greet every ship that came in. Yeah, can you remember uh, approximately the date? Oh, maybe uh, somewhere between the first to the fifteenth of June, nineteen forty-six. Somewhere there, I, I'm not sure. I was uh, then uh, sent to Fort Dix to be processed out, and uh, somebody asked me if I wanted to re-enlist. I said, no, not in active duty, but I'll re-enlist in the reserves. So I re-enlisted in the reserves. What ranking did you have then? At that time, I was a corporal. I was supposed to have been a sergeant, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you signed up for the reserves. And I signed up for the reserves as a, uh, as a corporal. Uh, I stayed in for three more years. In 1949, my enlistment was up. And uh, I re-enlisted again in the reserves. In 1950, the Korean War broke out. And about two or three months later, I was called to active duty. What, what did you do in those three years? Did you go back to Boston? or I went back to Boston. Yeah. Uh, I met my wife a year after getting out of the service. We were married in 1947. I tried to get into college, and I couldn't get in. Uh, there were just you know, tens of thousands of veterans vying for whatever space there was. Under the GI Bill. It under the GI Bill. Yeah. And, uh, but I could go to Northeastern Knights. So I signed, you know, I, I entered Northeastern going Knights. And, um, I was first on, um, I changed from inactive reserves, I went to the active reserves where you go to duty periodically, and then I decided to come out of the uh, active reserves because I needed so much time for studying, and I went to work on some kind of a job that kind of, as my grandsons would say, a yucky job, and uh, meanwhile going to studying engineering. and. Uh, I went back into, as I said, uh, the Army on active duty. I was sent to Camp Edwards. Excuse me a minute. Uh, Korea had broken out? Oh, yeah. And you were called up? Right. Okay. How did you feel about going back in the second time? Oh. Almost as excited as the first time, but now my wife of Three years. Was she excited about totally, it? Totally, yeah. totally beside herself. She would have, yeah. she would have, uh, I don't know what. But uh, anyway, I was sent to Camp Edwards and I uh, got the sergeant stripes that I 
lost out on during World War II. And uh, Captain called me in about uh, oh, two or three months after we'd been there. And he said, uh, we need a, a radar chief. And uh, he said, there's a school in, in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Forty men from the United States Army, that's from all over the world, are being sent there on a pilot program. The program is normally 40 weeks. With Korea going on the way it was going on, nobody could take a 40-week course. And, and uh, you know, they, they just needed communications and radar people immediately. So he said, the, the criteria is at least two or three years of college, which I had, and uh, you had to have been in combat someplace. And obviously, it's World War II. So he said, you're going to be one of the 40. So I thought that was pretty exciting. He said, when you come back, there's an automatic promotion. And uh, I called up my wife, and I said, uh, get ready, we're leaving. And she got all excited. To where? I said, we're going to Texas. Start packing. So she packed up our car, everything that we could take. We drove to Texas, and I spent uh, 13 weeks in Texas. And uh, came back. It's, it, I'm compressing it too much, but I came back in maybe uh, May or June, and uh, this outfit was doing trials, uh, and that's not the right word, where they were being evaluated. This was not an artillery, this was an anti-aircraft artillery unit, somewhat different than what I had been uh, familiar with. And you were the radar component? I became, I became the battalion radar chief. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would go out in the field and uh, try to shoot things down, and they, they, they were just lousy. It was a lousy outfit, whether they had lousy officers or lousy gunners, and they would fail their, their field trials. And so this outfit, it looked like it was not going to go overseas. Um, around... Uh, September, which was 11 months after I had been called up, after I had been called up, uh, I was called into the colonel's office, and he said, uh, you can get out. You're, you're, you can go back on inactive duty. I said, I don't get it. He says, this outfit is going nowhere. And he said, we've got some new recruits coming up. He says, but I don't want you to get out. He said, uh, I want you to stay. You have so much experience, so much training. I want you to stay with us. He said, there'll be a, another strike next year. And then two more years, you have to wait for that, for the uh, six stripes. So by now, you were a staff sergeant. That's correct. And uh, I said, it's not going to sit right with my wife. I know when, uh, when we were in Texas, she went to visit her girlfriend in California. And she tried to call me one day, and uh, she couldn't reach me. I was out someplace studying. And uh, she was just absolutely beside herself. She thought I'd somehow been, I don't know, sent overseas immediately or whatever. I don't know. So I uh, called her up, and I told her what was going on. She says, oh, absolutely not. I said, well, take the weekend. Think about it. I'll be home anyway. So I came home a few days later on uh, leave for a couple of days, and we talked and talked and talked. And by this time, I wasn't—I almost wasn't sure myself, because she was so upset. I, mean, I felt, you know, the, the same sort of feelings. I—I uh, uh, I don't know if the word love is too strong. I really, really. Loved the army. I loved the uh, the discipline. Uh, I just felt it was an experience that I if if I had missed it, I would I I never could have. I don't know if I could have lived with myself. 
was your decision then not to stay? My decision was to was to leave, and I went back to the colonel, and uh, he said, "It's your decision." He said, "You have it absolutely. You have it knocked." He said, "They're going to change some of the categories." He said, "There's no reason why you can't become a warrant officer, if that's what you want," because I had I had just you know, I had more experience than half the outfit, all put together. What was your cumulative military experience at this time? About three years, four years, and, and counting reserves, of uh, how much? Seven years. So did you think thirteen years more was? Not, I did. That's what we not, talked about. Yeah. Well, then you came home. Did you come home and were discharged? Uh, no, because I was put back on inactive duty. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't discharged until, uh, I don't know, 52 or 53. I think it was 53. I was a few days under nine years when I finally accepted a discharge. And uh, again, talked to my wife about just staying in the reserves, and she just just wouldn't hear of it. And I, I guess I didn't put up too much of a battle. You were ready to come home then? Maybe. I don't know. Summing up both of your wars, uh, could you pick out one incident that you would say was your most memorable experience? Aside from the one that lost you, your sergeant stripe. Yeah. Oh, that's like, I, in a way, that's that may be one of the most memorable. <laughs> I'll, I'll relate it. Uh, it's not really an obscenity that goes with it. It's just just close to it. Uh, I was always being sent on some communication deal with somebody, generally with a with another corporal or sergeant, so, you know, generally the same rank as I. I was a corporal. This lieutenant wanted to set up some kind of radio communications up on top of a mountain. This was just after the war ended. And, uh, this is in Germany. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we got up in the mountain, and uh, we set everything up, set up antennas, and we set up a tent, and we are trying to uh, communicate with the Corps headquarters. And uh, he just started to get through to them. And uh, he said, this thing isn't working. I says, oh, gee. So uh, it, started, it was a hand-cranking generator. So I said, well, maybe I'm not giving you enough power. And I said, cranked harder and harder. And he started talking and nothing. You know, it wouldn't go out because you, you hear this echo. If you're, if you're transmitting, you can hear your own echo. And obviously nothing was coming back in again. So I said, ah, shit. It's what's the matter? I said, there's a, a tube burnt out. So he said, uh, well, what are you going to do, Corporal? Fix it. Now, up to this point, I had been sergeant of the guard because his captain had put me in for sergeant. And my sergeant said he needed sergeants anyway. He says, you might as well start being a sergeant. You're going to be a sergeant. So all along, I'm still, for a month now, I've been a sergeant. Still wearing two stripes, but in my head I was a sergeant, and as far as the first sergeant was concerned, I was a sergeant. So uh, I said to, to the lieutenant, said, well, you're going to fix it, corporal? I said, yeah, I'll shit out a tube for you. Well, he looked at me, never said a word, packed the friggin' gear up. We packed everything up. Jim, my grandchildren hear this, they're going to wonder. But anyway, we packed all the gear up and went back down from the mountain. There's no sense staying up there. You can't do anything. And uh, it was a stupid request on his part. You know, I don't carry spare <laughs> tubes yeah. around. It was like carrying spare transistors. You don't do it. And uh, it was stupid on, more stupid on my part. But anyway, we get back down. And uh, I went to sleep. Next morning I got up and uh, I go into the orderly room to see if I have any orders. They would always post it. And it's posted Joris, Corporal of the Guard. <laughs> what the heck's this? 
So I go in and see the first sergeant. I says, how come I'm, I'm back to Corporal of the Guard? He says, you effed up, didn't you? I said, I didn't do anything. He says, tell me what happened up there. So I related the story. He says, now look in the wastebasket over there. What's in the wastebasket? He says, look in the wastebasket. So I go over and look in the wastebasket, and there in three or four pieces, Sergeant Jurass. He threw it in there, and he buried me. Because even though he left, I wasn't going to make sergeant. He made sure that, that whoever came in took his place, I wasn't going to make sergeant. So it wasn't until the Korean War <laughs> that I could get the stripes back. It took a second war to get yeah. the stripes. Yeah. <laughs> That's doing it the hard way, Vic. There are a lot of crazy things, other things that have hap had happened. Uh, when you came home, you had been, uh, you're now a veteran of two wars. How were you received when you came home? Korea was still going on, but yeah. you were a discharged veteran. Uh, do you have any take on how you were received as a veteran of the Korean War? I don't really recall anything. I, uh, World War II, uh, I have far more memories about things that happened during World War II. Uh, the Korean War was a, you know, it really wasn't a war, it was a, a police action. Uh, not that many of my friends went in during the Korean War, uh, just one other that I knew. Uh, whereas World War II, I don't think I knew anyone that didn't go in except one cousin who was just sickly and frail. Mm. But everybody was in. Every, every, every acquaintance, everyone in the street, uh, many were killed. As far as how I was received, I, I, I don't know. Your wife was glad to have you home. Uh, oh, yeah. how, how did you feel about being home after the, all those years in the service? Uh, it, it's an enormous letdown because you're, you're at such a high level of excitement all the time in the military. I think you're just, uh, mm -hmm. just riding on one wave of excitement after another especially during a war. <coughs> you're 73 years old now and you're looking back. How important to you was serving in the military? The most important thing in my life, next to my wife and children, I guess, but uh, it was, it was I, I couldn't think of enough superlatives to think of how important it was to me. It was extremely important. Can you tell us how it affected the rest of your life? Oh, in a, in a lot of strange ways. Uh, I, I went away a baby and in some respects came back an old man. Uh, there, are, there are many, many things that uh, happened uh, during the war that not, not so much bombs falling or, or just, just things in general that you never really let go of. Can you remember uh, or think about the way you were received when you came home um, and perhaps compare it with the way guys who went to Vietnam were received when they came home? I, I don't know that I can compare it. I know that they were, they were treated horribly. Uh, it was such a miserable, unpopular war. I considered going back in. Uh, during Vietnam, and yeah, they 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 would give me anything, they promised anything, to get me back in again. But even I didn't want to go back in. It was just that was such a horrible no-win situation. There's no no comparison to the to how we were received and how people acted. Uh, Is there any? One last thought you might want to share with us um, or your family who will view this tape or historians who will look at it at some time to sum up uh, what you've talked to us about today. It was a hell of a ride. It, uh, there were things that uh, 
a thousand people wouldn't experience what I experienced in, in a matter of days or weeks or months, never mind years. Uh, it's just some, some things are horrible. Uh, you never think you're going to die. You're immortal, which is more than I think of now. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate very much your coming in today.